If you enjoy this, I'd like you to please, please, please go to the Philosophy vs. Improv page on Apple Podcasts, the iTunes Store, wherever you listen to this, and leave a nice rating and review. If you don't know how to do this, there's even a nice little widget in the upper right of philosophyimprov.com to walk you through it. Thanks! This is Philosophy vs. Improv, where two sages try to teach each other a thing or two, and maybe you, the audience, get something out of it as well. I'm Mark Lintemeyer, a philosophy detective who's eager to learn improv. And I'm Bill Arnett, an improv teacher. Have we done that one yet? Let's just go keep it basic. An improv teacher, curious about philosophy. And our special guest today, introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Adora Fai, and I am a improv teacher, and can I use the term professional podcaster? Or will I be laughed out of earth? I think as long as 1% of your income comes from podcasting, you're a professional <laughs> podcaster. I think 99% of my income comes from podcasting. Damn. Well, then you're definitely a professional podcaster. I think the words just have so much stigma to them. Almost as much as improv teacher. <laughs> we very much appreciate your time then coming to join us as you don't tend to ask a doctor to uh, just on the street, hey, hey uh, I'm, we're doing some medical stuff too. You want to come over and do some? You want to do some of that? I do that. I'll see. I'm like, you're a doctor on the street. And then I'll uh, lift up my shirt and be like, what's this? I'm a nightmare. <laughs> Socially, I'm a nightmare. I'm sure at the hospital, there's some doctor who just isn't very busy. He just kind of wanders between the operating rooms. How's it going, <laughs> you all? <laughs> you a hand or anything? No, cool. Okay, cool. cool. Okay, cool, 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 cool. I'm scrubbed if you need a hand. No. <laughs> we have been uh, carefully spacing out our Hello from the Magic Tavern associated improvisers, or else we would just mm. have only people associated since you've had everybody on there as a guest at some point or not, you know, in the improv world actually had, had Noah or Linda been on there. We haven't had Noah or Linda to my recollection, but we've had, I mean, one of the best additions to our universe and one of our better episodes or episodes would be Bill Arnett who's sitting right here. Oh, Peshaw. So it's great to see Bill. Of course. (laughs) Yeah. In the Magic Tavern Hall of Fame. Oh, thank you. Yes, I regard this uh, effort as a bastard child of your your effort. I know it is the nature of podcasting that you spurt your seed to the wind. So, of course, there will be bastard children all over the fact that... that I should also say, socially, I'm a nightmare because I spurt my seed to the wind. (laughs) Gross. And then it hits a doctor, and he's like, what are you eating? You need to change your diet. And through uh, my various projects, I've had a, a few of you, the parents, acknowledge Arnie not not yet. He's the, the deadbeat dad, has not <laughs> responded to anything. So I'll just keep uh, you know bringing him up in the third person whenever we need an off-screen uh, personality. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So you're familiar with the general format, and you were scared of it, if I recall. I'm not scared of the format. I think just the, I listened to the No episode, and I very much enjoyed it, but I think it was just... It went a lot deeper than I was expecting to go, and I uh, I think I'm just, maybe I don't have the vocabulary or the articulation at, at moments <laughs> to keep up with you two in the race. This has been good for me, this podcast, is that I never sat on the roof in college of the apartment building smoking marijuana, talking about the nature of the universe. Sure. So I, I miss that, so now I get to do that. Now I get yeah. to pretend to be amazingly high and <laughs> thoughtful about common things. Yeah, love it. Have you ever really looked at a 20-ounce bottle? Like, really looked? I mean, it's certainly, the outside of it is more than 20 ounces. <laughs> if you, if you <laughs> it displaces more than 20 ounces. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Done. It's in the can, Mark. We're done. Thanks, everybody. A suggestion Woo! for a format today. I've been, in general, throwing out a philosophical concept, and then we riff on it. But instead of doing that, the general area in tribute to your hosting the Hey Real Real podcast has something to do with questions. So I'll give you that okay. much. But I thought, Bill, unless you have something else in mind, then maybe I would start us on a scene. And this could be, we could make this last the whole thing. Or we could stop it, or Adel could switch characters five minutes in, or we could stop it and then resume it. It is a flexible format and mostly depends on how much you hate the characters that I've chosen. <laughs> I, I got to say, as an improviser, I love switching characters mid-scene. <laughs> <laughs> okay, difficult enough to do live when people can see you. Uh, <laughs> switching characters and horses mid-scene are my two favorite things. I have something, I brought something in, but it will be inobtrusive to the scenes most likely. Okay. And as we've been doing, I have been modeling a certain behavior. 
And Adel may not know it by name, but he certainly knows it by principle. And we'll see if Mark can grasp what I'm doing. Cool. So the advantage of this, uh, this format is it, it replicates something of the podcast format. That it, uh, I am the great uh, detective inspector Schwa, and I'm here with mm. my, uh, my American friend, Dr. Billiam. And uh, we have some questions for you, uh, Mr. Is it uh, Reginald Pickpotty? Is that right? Did I get the name right? Yes. Yes, Reginald, P- you did say peak body, yes? Uh, I thought it was peak putty, but peak body? Oh, all right. I, 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 oh, I, I'm sorry. My name is, no, you're correct. It is peak potty, but I do believe in my own consciousness I have the peak body. I am 42 years old and I keep it tight, so. Okay. I, the whole time I thought it was pig potty. <laughs> oh, like, no, I do like have a bathroom. A, like a pig I bathroom. have a pet, yes, I have a pet pig, but he uses his trough as a toilet, so, uh. That's He's a little really? confused. He yes. uses his trough as a toilet? He That's where he eats. Where, that's where he he eats. is where he eats. Yep. Wow. Okay. He's a real he's a he's a rap scallion. <laughs> pigs being pigs. Now, now Dr. Billy no, note the the fact of the pig that will be very important as we, as we I'll write it down. I'm, I'm writing down everything. I'm writing uh, down. And everything. feel free to uh, chime in with your your own questions, Dr. Billy. I, I found that having a a lesser mind to ask the obvious questions is uh, is very helpful in my pursuits, as you as you well know, having accompanied me on uh, 436 separate investigations to date. Wow! 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 Uh, many s- investigations. Many of those are still ongoing. We get a little bored. Uh, I have to say, in case I, when I get nervous, I tend to ask rhetorical questions. Is that okay? You, you, you know, we're not with the police. You have no obligation to uh, just, you know, regard yourself as someone merely being questioned. You may question us back. We can explore the situations together. Good to hear. Good to hear. Then I'm, I'm ready and willing whenever you're, whenever you're ready and willing. Well, we wanted to ask about a research partner in your university who has uh, dead under mysterious circumstances. Uh, the police have called it a accident. However, the inspector here has been retained by certain parties to verify the police's uh, assumptions. Yes, of course, a very tragic instance. I uh, assume you're uh, referring to Daniel Veronica's, uh, yes. one of my best and brightest. Um, there was an explosion at the lab, and I do, uh, I have spoke to the police already, and, um, I hope that anything I say now lines up with what I told them, because, again, I get nervous when terrible things happen, and, um, mm-hmm. uh, When you said best and brightest, were, were you, were you being polite, or was this person yeah. the best and brightest student you've ever had? Between the three of us here, I will say, uh, uh, his parents were in the room when I was being questioned by the police. So I like when a friend is like, you know, I'm going to apply for a new job and they might call you. Could you do me a favor? You know, it's, it's that kind of thing where I, say, oh, I miss them so much. They were the best and brightest. They were so tall and so, mm-hmm. you know, you know, smelled wonderful. So really yeah, their, tried to. Their parents wouldn't be aware of their height, I guess. You'd want oh, to well. <laughs> b- butter that up a little bit. Yes. Now in, well, he, he loomed large in the field, is what I like to say, whether that be figurative or metaphorical. Okay, all right. And were okay. you in the habit of saying uh, complimentary things about this gentleman before his death, or were you perhaps a, a bit hard on the boy? Can I just say your enunciation is stellar. I just, and you wear that suit so well. Um, what was the question again? Were you a good boss, a good mentor to this, this lad? I like to think so. I mean, once one takes anyone under their wing, how, how well can they really judge them? It's too insular a relationship. But I like to think that I tended to his every need and gave him the backing and support. And um, excuse me, I'm sorry. I'm just thinking of his death. Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, your research, I believe, involves dreams, correct? Yes, dreams, both lucid and otherwise. Yes. Uh, I watched, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but in my field, there's a movie, it's a very small title, What Dreams May Come, starring Robin Williams and Cuba Gooding Jr. I saw that, and as a teenager, I was off to the races. I said, Mama, Papa, please, let me go into anything dreams. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Uh, here we are today. You said Cuba and not Cuba. Is that correct? Yes, Cuba. Mm, no, particularly, I think, I think this man might have some uh, geographical background that has not been shown to us. The accent seems to waver. Not like mine is, is entirely consistent. And don't worry, as you question me and uh, pepper me with allegations, 
I'm not going to hop in my 1950s car and drive away. I'll be right here with you two, smoking cigars. May I? Oh, another rhetorical question. I'm already lighting up. We, we, uh, we, that will be fine. Not in particular uh, the aware? brand of cigar, hmm? Dr. Billiam. Oh, oh, this again. He fancies that he can tell tobacco brands, you know, you by... Just, you just smell it. Smell an ash. You smell it. It, is, it sounds, it smells cheaper than I would expect from a man of his I was his once stature. married to a woman who could distinguish a Yankee candle from any other candle just by smell. <laughs> that it was from the Yankee candle shop? Yes. Anytime we wanted to do the Yankee candles shop, she could distinguish any candle in there. Quite impressive. Yeah. You know, my problem with that place is you walk in there and it's just, how do you tell them all apart? It's this barrage of smells, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Have some colored information. Uh, have some sort of, there should be some sort of spectacle when you light a candle, much like fireworks. You can distinguish a firework by the way they explode. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So in these uh, Yankee candle explode. shops, it sounds like all the candles were lit. Otherwise, how uh. could you tell them from the smoke? It, it's a very different experience just smelling the candle directly versus lighting it and then filling it up the, the air. Yes, I see what you're getting at. I would say um, a healthy portion were lit, uh, almost for, you know, uh, example's sake of, hey, smell this. This might be a good one to pick up if you're not sure what to get for a graduation or for a cousin's birthday. So a few were lit, yes, um, just to sort of uh, display their smell, as it were, in the, in the uh, aromic sense. But there were many unlit, and I myself did not light or dis- or extinguish any of them, I do have to say. And can I just say, you have the broadest shoulders I've ever seen. What, do you work out? I've, I've lifted many, uh, the, the weight of my duties. Uh, oh, lifted, oh, wow. The responsibility he's, he's, of the world rests upon my shoulders. He's bashful. He did this super G in the Olympics in 1934. He's bashful. <laughs> 34, wow. Downhill, Super G. It was the first year at the Super G downhill. Did you meet Carl Lewis? Or would that be Jesse Owens? I forget. Uh, I I do not know these people of which you speak. Uh, Look, I understand that these candle aromas might affect people's dream states. Is that that mm. correct? And that they're smelling something, perhaps? Yes, they say that eyes are the windows to the souls, but Uh nostrils are the back door to memories. So anytime you say you smell... They say that. I'm sorry. I say that. Okay. Uh, here's my paper. I've brought a laminated copy. This is uh, recently published in Dream Monthly. Congratulations. But, but if you catch a whiff of cucumber, say you walk by in uh, a kitchen and someone has their window open, you smell a whiff of cucumber, suddenly you're whisked back to that time you went on your honeymoon and perhaps you got a massage and you had some cucumbers over your eyes or perhaps uh, you catch a whiff of banana and suddenly you're laughing because you remembered a joke you uh, read when you were six eating a piece of Laffy Taffy and you looked at the wrapper. I mean, this is the power of smells. Huh, okay. Do you, uh, have you noticed any instances, perhaps in your work with pigs, where smells can kill through dreams? Oh, well, um, seems like a loaded question. Uh, anything with pigs? I mean, I have a pet pig. Uh, I don't, he seems he's around here somewhere, uh, but. I've not noticed a link between pigs and smells. I mean, pigs definitely have uh, a very acute sense of smell. Speaking of acute, (laughs) I have to say, Detective, you are looking uh, very acute with those wingtip shoes. (laughs) For uh, your forgiveness, your forgiveness. But some pigs can uh, sniff and search out truffles. You've heard of this, yes? A rhetorical question you don't need to answer. I'm nervous again. But pigs do have... uh, Pigs are like the snipers of the animal community, right? Okay. Dogs can smell everything. They're like the, you know, dogs are like the tanks or like the, um, you know, the big guns that by the end of the shooting, there's like a, a six foot pile of bullets behind the person, uh, artil- heavy artillery. But pigs are the snipers. They can search out one exact scent. But the one shot, one kill. Yeah, yes, yes. And uh, forgive me, I should not have called pigs snipers when we're dealing with a death by explosion from a, a bullet that... Uh, hit my friend and exploded inward. Hmm. Yeah, I hear if that happens in your dream, it happens in real life. That, is that a thing? Yes, we call that uh, Freddyisms. With uh, Yes, if something happens to you in your dreams, you feel the effects in real life, and that can occur with death. Ah, named after, of course, Freddy Kramer, the famous dream psychologist. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Oh, uh, any of, if you can pick up any of Freddy's works, Kramer versus Freddy, Freddy versus Kramer... 
just a, a slew of wonderful written papers. Well, I mean, that guy in the field of dream research, he was a warrior. I think Absolutely, you would agree. Yes. I was yes. I, I was shown that Kramer versus Kramer as a as a very young person. It was very depressing. It was not a good thing to show me quite that young. I think that uh, really set me on my course in life. Well, it's a little disturbing because in his papers he battles himself. So it's a little. Uh, it is. It gets a little intense, a little extreme. It is the course, human yes. condition, is what I'm saying. Yes, yes, battling yes, yourself. yes. But can I also say when Freddie Kramer makes an entrance, he makes an entrance. The way he walks into a room. Swings the door open so hard, steps into it with such a plum, almost falls over. I mean, his, his entrance is like no other. Yeah, and it always it never fails to get applause. Uh, yes, when, yes, when yes. He enters. But of course, there was the controversy. So, in my field, we don't bring up his name, or if we do, we say Freddie or Freddieism. So uh, we we tend to drop off his last names due to the recent controversy uh, from from. Uh, well, you've heard of sure, of course. Yeah, yeah. Now, what is the name? My pig is uh, Captain Butters, and um, he's a good little boy. Um, uh, if you're asking, if you're, you're trying to get me to Captain tell you where... Captain Freddy Butters? Well, uh, come to think of it, yes, he does have a middle name, which is Freddy. Named after, of course, Freddy Kramer. Sorry to say the last name. Do you, can you any reason why you think that the deceased might ha- have been killed? Gambling debts, uh, yes. love triangle... Hmm? Uh, yes to Gambling- both. A love triangle and gambling debts. Yes, he bet he bet his friend that he could not sleep with his wife. Okay, and he won that bet. All right. And was uh, was this wife's name Red Herring for your for providing us with all this irrelevant information to distract from the succession of pigs? Well, her name, as noted on this receipt, that you have not had what one pig named Freddy, but a succession of pigs used for your diabolical experience. Uh, attempts to jump out the window, slams into the wall. Uh, listen, um, listen, I'll come clean, okay? Whatever you think I did, I did it, okay? I want to make a name for myself, see? My papers aren't being published in the quantity that I want them to. I'm not getting the recognition that Freddy Kramer, say, would get, or uh, even my assistant. So please, take me in, but whatever you do, spell my name right in the report. Get the word out there. Well, you're coming with us. Can you just give us the details? Pig potty? Pig potty? Potty pig? Is it, is it pig potty? I don't Pick, something pick potty. Pig potty. Is that right? Um, you, yes. Can we just get a little more clarity on the, the actual scheme? Now, from what I understand, it was a... He admitted it. He admitted he killed his partner and shot him, covered it up with an explosion set off by a Yankee candle. I think it's cut and dry. All right. See, it's just the dreamscape element was a little unclear to me. I thought this involved yes, some that's the thing. pigs going into the brain, assassin pigs going into dreams. What? How did this work exactly? My dear friend, my, my crime, much like dreams, is hard to remember. I mean, unless as soon as I committed the murder, I wrote everything down in a journal, I tend to forget uh, 70 to 85 percent of it. Well, luckily, we have your journal right here. We've already known this entire time. Trats. Uh, I would like to also light for you a blood-scented candle. Oh, no. I'm being whisked back. <laughs> oh, no. No, put that down. No. Captain Butters, please. Oh, no. And that's the probably, nightmares I'll have. That's Yay, we did it. Okay. Probably enough. All right. Okay, I had another eight minutes of emotional breakdown, but I guess we'll save that <laughs> yeah. for another episode. <laughs> Podcasting Oscars will have missed out on that obvious nominee, clear nominee. Please, Bill, Poskers. The Poskers. I'm sorry, I, I don't feel I have the... I'm not a professional, I'm only semi-pro, triple A, <laughs> triple A podcaster. The iHeartRadio Poskers. Now, yeah. <laughs> did, you, did you get what I might have been going for in terms of questioning, particularly the way in which people in that sort of situation and the way that that scene turned out, what sorts of questions are asked? I mean, what I noticed was just from on the fly, it seemed like you were maybe asking leading questions. I don't think there's anything terribly cut and dry. There was always like a, was it this kind of thing or was this, you know, so it felt like it was all leading and that um, as an improviser, maybe not my job, but my want would be to accept all of that as gifts and run with it versus being like, no, that's not right. Here's the real answer. In the moment, I, I think it's always great to just lean on whatever information is available and expound upon it. So like when Bill said, was it a gambling problem? I think it's so much easier to just be like, 100%, and here's what the gamble was, versus being like, no, it was jealousy. You know, So I, that's what I was kind of sensing, but I, I couldn't quite tell. 
Bill, any any ideas? No, that would be my guess as well. Are, are questions where you already know the answer? Yes. So that is a a thing. I'll just spell it out in philosophy called uh, Mino's paradox. So it is the idea that how can you who's paradox? Mino. M e n o. Mino is that a Greek name? Yes. It's after so there's a Platonic dialogue of Plato talking to a little slave boy and saying, "Hey, look, you can do geometry. Like, oh, let's do the Pythagorean theorem." And so it's supposed to prove that somehow knowledge of th- at least some things is is built in. And the reason for this is because how could you ask a question if you don't in some sense already know what the answer is or at least sort of what you're kind of aiming at? Otherwise, it's just like if you're trying to do philosophy for the first time and you've never heard anybody talk about it, you'd just be like, I don't, how are we even supposed to start here? And so that seemed like a pretty obvious thing to connect to improvisation. Very cool. Do you have to know the answer or admit that there is something at least driving you to that question? A curiosity or a... I guess this is a question I wanted to throw open. I mean, what's for lunch? To you I folks. mean, I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what's for lunch is. But you know that lunch is a thing. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, right? yeah okay. you know the kinds of things people typically eat for lunch. So it's not just like what. <laughs> it's what's for lunch. It's specifically, it's like you're filling in 90 percent of the information. You just have that little thing of what exact food. So that if I said sawdust is for lunch, or you know, going outside is for lunch, that wouldn't work. Well, there is a classic improv thing. I'm sure Adel probably had it yelled at him 20 years ago. It was just, don't ask questions. Now, I'm... Yes. I feel like that was the biggest hang-up really? when I first started starting doing improv, was you get so in your head because it's not the number one rule, but a huge rule is don't ask questions. And then later, I mean, <laughs> later in your career, you realize that that can all melt away. And it's just, it's just training wheels to fall off once you learn your center of balance. Yeah. And it's nothing we've talked about, Mark. It's one of those things that you turn on in a student, but later you need to turn it off or don't turn on at all because you will eventually have to turn it off. And that's a difficult quandary for teachers. What do I turn on in these students that I will later possibly regret or possibly have to in this moment at this place where they are in their journey? It would be good to do X, Y, or Z, knowing that five years from now, they will not want to be doing X, Y, or Z, if that makes sense. And in fact, Adel, you were doing something that I was kind of going for. The scene did not open itself to where I would like to have. But just because you accepted all these things that Mark was throwing on you, did you like it? As the improviser or as a character? As the character. As a character that I like everything he's throwing me. Yeah, I mean, I think... <laughs> he's a pretty easygoing character. <laughs> yeah, I think... Yeah. I mean, I think I gave myself that tick of like, when I get nervous, I ask rhetorical questions just to have like a backup in case sure, sure, sure. me, the improviser, ever stumbled or got nervous. But I think as the character, I thought it was, I think the character viewed it as, as like a little dance, almost like flirtatious. And so sure. I think that's why the, I kept coming back to like flattering the detective mm-hmm. and uh, flirting with him a little bit. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I will hold on what I had for a little bit later. I will admit that I, as I was taking a shower before this, <laughs> this episode, <laughs> I thought of the name Inspector Schwa because then I would have an excuse to just go, uh, and not know what question to ask because that's the, the sound of the okay. schwa is, uh. The, the noise. And I didn't have to do that because you guys were so giving and forthcoming. Bill asked the questions and set up what the crime was and there was no room to sound brain damaged. So <laughs> that was good. <laughs> Back to this thing about knowing the answer. <laughs> my favorite Sonic Youth album. <laughs> yeah. Not to get a little like, one of my usual pushbacks is the easy out of like, but can we really know anything? Does anything know anything? And saying that every time we ask a question that we necessarily know, and it feels a little, does anyone ever know anything? I mean, it was raised in the context of, yeah, people know a lot of things. And in fact, we know a lot more than we think we know. Because otherwise, we couldn't be searching for the, the answers in the first place. So if you're saying, well, sure. what is the meaning of life? Then like you have to have some notion that there is meaning or that that is even a possibility. I think people who are not raised religiously at all, because I know this just from asking this question from, to somebody as a teenager who is very, very not religious, whereas I had had sort of that background and him just finding it. And now I find it absolutely dumbfounding why you would think there could possibly be a meaning. In other words, there, unless there's somebody up there saying, this is what you're supposed to do then the idea of a meaning built into life just doesn't even make any sense. So okay. that is a, a question you could, one could allege because you're asking the question, then you already know, you actually, you know, so the religious people use this as a comeback. You actually know that there is a meaning and there is something you're supposed to be doing it. And if you deny that, then you are just denying your inner voice. 
Let's stop for a little break. Philosophy is all about stopping, reflecting. Think about how you are listening to this show right now. What device is transmitting the audio into your ears? Proper philosophical reflection should lead you to periodically shake things up. And I want you to literally be able to shake things up, shake your head around while you have earbuds in your ears and have them not fall out. That's because I'm talking about Raycon wireless earbuds. Their everyday earbuds look, feel, and sound better than ever. And they have a new awareness mode for when you need to listen to your surroundings. So you can take Raycons with you wherever you go. I have big, fat ear canals and their optimized gel tips provide the perfect in-ear fit. The earbuds are so comfortable and they will not budge. Try them. Put them in your ears. Shake your head around. Do they fall out? No. Shake your head more. Keep doing that for the next eight hours because that's how much Raycons offer eight hours of playtime with a 32-hour battery life. That's a lot of head shaking. And Raycons are priced just right. You get quality audio at half the price of other premium audio brands. It's no wonder Raycons everyday earbuds have over 48,000 five-star reviews. Right now, Philosophy vs. Improv listeners can get 15% off their Raycon order at buyraycon.com slash PVI. That's B-U-Y, Raycon, R-I-Y-C-O-N, dot com slash PVI to save 15% off Raycons. Buyraycon.com slash PVI. So you don't like it when people ask questions where they know the answer to, or it's very shallow, someone knowing it is an open question. Ultimately, I find this argument that you couldn't ask the question unless you basically knew the answer. Like, there's got to be something true about it, you know, like the lunch question. And I think the only way to sort of ferret this out is maybe through another scene, trying oh boy. some other context uh, in which we can see whether this actually makes sense or not. I mean, I just gave an example where I thought that actually this is being used in a rhetorically evil way, that you're trying to convince me that there is a God or something because because I think the question, is there a meaning of life, is like a question worth asking. Well, I have an idea. But quickly, would you say that many philosophizers or armchair philosophizers, to their detriment, are married to loaded questions or can't not ask questions they are you know leading or, or unfair questions? Just for some background, Adel, the, the difference between a philosopher, someone who does philosophy, but a philosophizer is someone who takes philosophy and grinds it up and throws it back in your face. I think that's the difference. Is that, <laughs> okay, is that, fair enough, is fair that okay. what you're referring to? Yes. Yeah, so I completely ignored what question you actually asked. I to, think a philosophizer has waited on me before. <laughs> <laughs> Olive Garden yeah. in uh, 2004. Would you like some ground pepper? This is, this I mean, is how what I philosophy are is. In a my bottomless, face? Oh. bottomless salad bowl? Really? A bottomless <laughs> salad bowl? <laughs> That's philosophy. Never is there a limit bread to the breadsticks? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's get mathematical. <laughs> Take the limit of breadsticks. And it becomes like Theseus's ship where the waiter's like, well, you started with eight breadsticks and as we replenished them, it no longer became your breadsticks. But they're exactly. an entirely new basket, which is for the next customer. So your breadsticks are done. Yeah. Or your breadsticks are still in the field somewhere for your next <laughs> visit. Preparing for your next visit. Yes. They're never ending, but you have to be patient. We have to. Uh, well, I'm getting the, that Italian feast platter. So if you feel free to tag on some of that, look who's here. <laughs> Mark made it. Mark made it. <laughs> uh, yeah. He made it to dinner. How's it the going, The difference man? between the breadstick and the rest of the universe, you know, it's all kind of a continuum. It's all particles coming in and out. So yeah. by bottomless breadsticks, I mean bottomless stuff among which there is bread ships, you know. Here's what I want to know, Mark. Also, if you serve alcohol, they legally can't be bottomless. For health and safety reasons. Yes, they can be topless, but they can't be bottomless if you serve alcohol. Because that's gross. Because that's gross. Speaking of bottomless and topless, Mark, we hear you had a hot date last night. Details, please. Hey, let us know. So I went out Don't. first to Stucky's, where I go. Give us the time. We want every okay. detail. Give us the time. What were you wearing? You, were you wearing you, curve? You were woke you wearing- up. When did you wake up? I woke up yesterday. I, when did you wake up? I slept most of the day. I woke uh, up at oh, 4.56 okay. p.m. Ooh, the kissing hour. I put on just about everything that I could fit on. Slower, it's slower, really, slower. It's really cold up here mark, in the north. Mark, 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 slower, uh-huh. slower. How'd you put your pants on? <laughs> okay, yeah, you, you would think gross. one leg at a time. You're being gross. But- I just, I like to just jump right in. Yeah. Okay. All right. Looney Tunes style. <laughs> Got in the car. I had to warm it up. Your, cent- your Sentra? 
Yeah, I had to warm the car up. I had to, I had to, I had to ease yeah. that key and then just let it sit. All right, nice. Don't be gross. Don't be gross. Played, I play. I got the tunes going. Nice. What are we talking? What are we talking? Beach Boys. We're talking some uh, classic. Yes. Oh boy. Close to the edge. Oh, okay. I was some prog. Some I was, UK prog. Yeah, I just I like to prog really gets me going when I'm going to do a Stucky's yeah. run. And then I, I pulled it out <laughs> the car. I pulled the car out of the driveway. It was yeah, later nice. that I yes, safe, yes, safe, yeah, safe yeah. way to do it. And uh, I like to uh, uh, hit that button that turns off the rear camera like as soon as I'm in drive. Oh, yeah. Because I don't like to let it go off by itself because when it's on, the volume of the music is down. Okay, let's yes. go get to the action. Can we go? So you pick her up, you drive to her house and pick her up. Got to her house. I got out of the car. I what are we talking? Just, bungalow, I didn't just bungalow, hop. duplex, garden apartment. What are we talking? It's a, it's kind of a mansion. Oh, this is this is, uh, this is like the, sh- the sugar sugar mommy that I'm going for here. She's uh, okay. I didn't know this. This is new information. She's 69 years old. That's an oh, angel. Man. That's the dream of Sugar Mama. Does she have a younger sister who wears a yellow coat and carries an umbrella? Morton Salt, baby. <laughs> It, the, sorry, the whole I have, thing, I, I'm going through know, a breakup. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I know I'm peppering this with a lot of details, but uh, how do you feel about going out with a 69-year-old lady? That's twice your age. Is this... They get the best coupons. They bring... So, like, when we got to Stucky's, I knew that yeah, yeah. it was going to be at least half off of my uh, my chicken tenders. Well, can I ask, why are you concerned about it being half off if she's paying for everything? She pays for everything, but she is very uh, strangely stingy. So, uh, you know, the sugar mama thing is, uh, you know, I got to I gotta kind of work for it. It's more like a sweet, it's more like a sweet and low mama. Yeah, I got to kind of work, I got to kind of work for it. I, I thought you, an equal mama. I thought you went to Stucky's ironically, but it's sounding like this was <laughs> like, she really wanted to go. Come on, everyone goes to Stucky's ironically. Stucky's and Fat Dave's, or what's it called? <laughs> Fat Dave's, Hot Dave's, what's that? Right? I just Famous suggested Dave's. it. Famous Dave's. I find Stucky's to be mm, the most erotic restaurant chain. Mm, Cause it almost sounds like Stickies. Yeah, in fact, it, it's almost the kind of name that you might pull out of the air, even if you'd never been to that restaurant in your life mm. and couldn't provide any have. details of what went on inside. So you just had to make them up completely. That's that's the kind of restaurant that I take my. It's got uh, that- Country trucker vibe uh, aesthetic, I guess. Yeah, it's like Cracker Barrel for a holes. P- pretty much a low class Cracker Barrel. When you when you're not dressed nice enough to get into Cracker Barrel, you go over to the Stuckies. Or when the peg game has had your number too many times. Yeah, <laughs> sir, sir, you're not allowed in here anymore. <laughs> Since you stole those Andy Griffith DVDs, we're not letting you into Cracker Barrel anymore. And your cufflinks are our button candies? Get out of here. Sorry, we've had, uh, we've had some bad experiences. Uh, what you, Mark, you were saying. Yeah, I mean, the thing I really like about Stuckies, uh, I mean, apart from sort of the, there are lap dances available, and it's really kind of spice things up if you've got a couple there and you invite one of the dancers over. But, you know, that's kind of a, it's an off the menu kind of thing. Mm. Um, this has gotten super erotic. That's what I'm talking about. If you order the chicken tenders, but you say, I only want, Two tenders. That's when they know that they can let you in the back room uh, where the magic happens. I have to assume so many elderly people have accidentally gained access <laughs> due to lack of appetite or, or uh, band surgery. O- old people and children uh, have probably, I can see a parent just like trying to limit their child's, you know. Oh, I guess they said two tenders. I guess this seven year old is going to the back. <laughs> You know, which is horrifying. Horrifying. I sh- I, I, it makes me smile, but it's I'm smiling because of how horrified I am. I should clarify that that Florence, the lady in question, though she is 69 years old, she kind of looks like she's about 12. Like she was just one of those really oh. short women who's like she, like a very shriveled 12. Like a 12 oh, yeah. year old who's all really big in the sun. Mark, all you had to say was she's one of those short women. And we immediately, we no, immediately, precisely. yeah, yeah. I mean, so many women shrink as the, and men uh, shrink as they age. Yeah. I've been trying to do more of that because I feel like if I had more room over my head as I walk through doors, yeah. that it would yeah, just yeah. be like I'd have more hat options. Yeah. Not to make anyone sad, but when my grandpa died, by the time my grandpa died, we had to dress them all in Oshkosh Bagosh. It was... Um, You're kidding. It, no. Really? It was, uh, it was very sad. It was... Um, huh. 
Wow. But we all, to some degree, we all go through it. You know, whether it's just a hunchback or a literal shrinkage, it's just um, something we all are going to be experiencing. I'm jumping off a bridge at 55. I've made that clear from the day I met both of you. (laughs) So, Because you're such a Van Halen head. (sighs) Yeah. The Red Rocker was a neighbor of ours as a child, and he is like a father to me. Wow. And uh, I have some stories oh, I see, can tell. I, I was thinking Ooh, about that. details. Oh. Well, I mean, we're talking about Mark's hot date yes, here. Yes, of course, of and, course. Sorry, details all right, on the date. All right, we're in the, the back. Date. We're in the back room with the Stuckies, uh, Florence and I, and the, the lap dancer, who is really getting quite uh, risque with the lapping. Mm-hmm. I, have to say, I, mean, I was expecting uh, that we would be pulling this story from you like we're trying to pull teeth <laughs> out of your head. And not only have you been incredibly forthright with these details, they have been far more than I certainly bargained for. Yeah, the lack of coaxing is shocking. <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm still sort of buzzed because there's a lot, a lot of Stucky's brand cocaine. And oh, so they have their own cocaine. They, I, it's sort of it's like makes, like in a sort of Pez dispenser sort of thing. It's it's really cute. Nice. I you know I always am curious why they're still in business. This makes so much more sense now. Yeah. I mean, you can't. If only Blockbuster would have picked up that. They're surely not staying in business with those pecan rolls. Ugh, ugh. And keep in mind that we had half off the cocaine so we could have twice as much for the same price. All right, let's talk your long term plans. Is this someone, is this a thing is this now? Serious? Is this, yeah, is what's this going serious? Yeah. Is this serious? Well, I'm hoping to inherit. Yes. I mean, that's kind of the, the purpose of the whole thing. I mean, I have to get my temporary divorce with my actual wife, but then, you know, Pursuing this you're, thing to its logical conclusion, which you're gold digging. You're yeah, gold yeah, digging. Yeah, for sure. Aren't you worried? I mean, not to sound, I don't know, cynical, but aren't you worried that she has like some clause in her will where it's like, you get my inheritance, but you have to spend one night in my mansion? Like, isn't that a concern of yours? And if so, like, do you need us to come help stay the night and like solve mysteries? What's happening there? I was thinking that maybe I do need some legal advice, and I know that mm. both of you have some experience in this. Paralegal. If if we could, I don't want to go all the way. I don't, that's we that's, are a paralegals. Yes. So I've, uh, for instance, already uh, forged this codicil oh. to her. To her well, it's not forged exactly. I wrote it, and then I just got her super super wasted and had her sign it. I'm not sure it's going to stand up. Well, that may not stand up. That may not stand up. As a pair of paralegals, uh, we may not, that may not be. Yeah, we we'll probably won't hold up in court. Not pass muster. But she'll be dead at the time that it would be challenged. I mean, it's, it's just, I'm worried about drunk signature versus regular signature. Like, is mm-hmm. drunk signature look enough like regular signature for it to be? Legal? Are there any children? Any children? Is there a cat involved? Is there? A- oh, yeah. Any sort of pet's going to get a huge chunk of that money. I mean, there is that pet pig. There's that Freddy, that oh. fucker. Um, but I'm thinking that, you know, I, I can fry that bastard up before it really comes to that right of ownership. You got, you got to be careful, Mark, because so many of these elderly people, they leave these little videos. They're going to be played at, you know, once they die, they're going to get everyone in a room and play these videos and you don't know what they're going to say. They might accuse you of, you know, of, of gold digging. They might have your number and they might just be using you for romance currently. So you just got to be careful because these elderly people are so tricky, so slippery. I mean, she was filming me at the Stuckies while we were doing all this yeah. stuff. Is, well, that, is that a bad sign? Horrible sign. Terrible sign. Terrible sign. Do we know? What, did she have a cell phone or was it like a it was like an old time sixteen millimeter? I mean, she was she was doing camcorder like a Zapruder film type. Uh, she was using her cell phone, and then she had another cell phone that was like on one of those stands so that she could get multiple angles. But I thought this was just for remarketing. Just, just like an elderly person to have two cell phones in case they want to make more than one call. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I think, you know, it's so you could do that intercom thing where you just like put the baby monitor software on one and then you could, you could watch your pig from, from, so one of them usually is showing the pig and what the pig is doing. Okay. 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 You could probably pull it off with one phone, but I imagine yeah, a, just an older woman seems may not sufficient, but just so savvy. Well, congratulations. This yeah. We're so happy for you. Good. Um, I do have worry about the lapsanter's corpse and whether that was properly disposed of. But you know, it's probably it's probably oh, all fine. We as a pair of paralegals, we can't hear this. I didn't uh, hear anything. 
I will say, I, I don't know if I was uh, overreaching, but I did order for you, Mark. I got you the Italian wedding soup, um, just in a sense of hopefulness. Is that like for that you can put meats and pieces of bodies in the soup so that they're then uh, just consumed? And that's a really good idea. Thank you oh, so God, much. Oh, God, Mark, what? Did you bring chunks of the body here? I mean... La 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 la. la, 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 la they're, they're in the car. La 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 la. la, 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 la. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Look, we're in the Olive Garden, okay? The salad's bottomless, the breadsticks are endless, and the good times are forever. All right, man. Let me get another read on that. Another read on that. Mark, we're at Olive Garden. <laughs> the salad is bottomless, the breadsticks are in- endless, and the memories are forever. That was much better, I think. The memories. Yeah. Chin chin. Yay, yeah, we did yay. it. Oh, right. <laughs> so those were some questions you guys had going. Was there a strategy? I see, I like the questions thing. I'm surprised that this is a is it because you're putting the responsibility on the other person to actually do the improvising if you ask a question? That's the classic answer. My rejoinder to that classic answer is please ask me questions, even if it makes me because then I get to improvise more. I get to make stuff up. I don't, I don't. I like to be on the spot. I showed up to be on the spot. That's why I'm on stage. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I think when I first started classes, the main reasoning I was getting for not asking questions was that idea of like, you're putting the onus on the other person. And I can see instances where, I mean, I was definitely a part of scenes in classes where somebody would come out on stage, look at me and initiate with the line, where are we? <laughs> it's just the thing of like, yeah. oh no, you have nothing. And then you you start to panic because you're like, I followed this person onto stage because I thought they had something. Then they turn to me and said, where are we? And then I say the catacombs and they go, no, we're not, you know? (laughs) So I've definitely been in situations like that. But I do think to speak to what Bill just said, as you flex that muscle more and more and as you get better as an improviser, you realize that, you know, we talk about improv reflecting real life. In real life, there's so many questions. And in real life, I don't want to speak for everyone, but personally, I love being asked questions in real life because it shows someone's taking an interest in me. So I love that idea of like in improv for the character to be asked questions is fun because you get to think specifically about that. You know, if, the, if somebody asks the question of like, tell me anything, or I guess even tell me a secret, it's a little pointed. But if it's too open-ended, I could see where it might be. You have too much at your disposal to sort of parse through. But if it's almost a little more of a pointed question, it is really thrilling as an improviser to be like, now I get to fill in the blank. It's almost like Mad Libs yeah. where I get to fill it, fill in that information and be playful with it. So I, I, Bill, I think that's fantastic. Yeah, and you did a great job with those questions, Mark. It's something we've talked about in the past, details, and that ultimately it's all about details, you know, and answering those questions with lots of information, tons of information. In this instance, too much information, too much. <laughs> I like the experience of being questioned and having to come up with a story sequentially, as opposed to what normally happens, which is I have to very quickly come up with a detailed backstory of whatever the hell it is we're doing here. And it's not going to make sense. And I'm trying to look for excuses to put in more details about it or work out problems with it when really, you know, we should be dealing with what is right in front of us in the scene. Right now. Yeah. My only note, Mark, how do you feel about telling us all this? Have you been dying to tell us? Or are you, were you afraid that we would ask? That's your advance note. That's a season two note right there. I was certainly forthcoming. <laughs> you were forthcoming, but it was the kind of thing. It's like, dudes, I can't wait to tell you about this. Mm. Or, I don't know, you know, two vast different examples. That's a season two note right there, Mark. That's a season two note. All right. I was trying to do, I don't, I don't know if it came across, something I was trying to do, but it's just it kind of, well, I'll just say, I don't the cat out of the bag. I couldn't do it super purely like I wanted. Going along with this whole idea, as, as Adel said, that, you know, our lives are full of questions and we like being asked questions. Our lives are also full of people saying no or pushing back against us a little bit, but we don't have to push back aggressively. It's not a fight. And you can offer resistance, yet still welcome the question. And the smiling no, uh, the, oh, Ooh, yeah. I don't know, I don't know, I, I, I'm not going to, mm. uh, don't make me. Uh, <laughs> but as an actor, I know very, very well that I will be doing whatever this thing is. I will be talking about my date. I will be doing this, even though I'm offering resistance to it. And sometimes improvisers, young improvisers, any kind of resistance is verboten or considered denial or considered not cool. 
And I just wanted to push back against that a little bit. I've also seen a lot of improvisers where it's like they, when asked a question in a scene, they will hem and haw. It's almost a tactic to buy themselves time. Mm -hmm. Where if you said like, uh, what kind of car did you drive? They'd be like, what kind of car did I drive? I mean, that's a very personal (laughs) question. But if you (laughs) must know... And it's clear that they're buying themselves time to think of, to be like, I can't think of a single brand of car. (laughs) So they hem and haw as a tool to buy themselves time, I think is very funny. Just to toss out an anecdote, maybe the hardest I've ever broken on stage was doing a scene with Louis Saunders. And I was playing like a prison guard who was trying to allow people in to like, we were doing an execution, a very dark scene. We're doing an execution and only the family was supposed to come into the room to watch it. And so I had a list of names and I was like, as people were coming in being like, oh, are you a member of the family, et cetera? And I asked the question to Louie, which was, what is your name? That was the only question I asked him. And it's not a question I typically ask, but in this instance, it was appropriate. And he took maybe 40 seconds of silence and looked around the room and like folded his arms and was kind of like scratching his chin. And then he looks at me dead in the eyes and goes... Crab Rangoon. <laughs> and it was, and it got like two minutes of laughter because he was being so thoughtful about it and clearly weighing his options and like, do I give a fake name? I'm clearly not part of the family, you know? So it was just, it was so funny that with a question like that, he took up so much space. And then when he finally said his answer, it hit so hard because he was weighing his, we saw his mental process and it was such a, he had all the time in the world to think of a fun name or a clever name. And all I came up with was Crab Rangoon, which to me is still funny and clever, but truly just maybe the best example of like, you can ask a question and get a response and it's still very much funny and fun and playful and not, it doesn't kill the scene. The audience is aware that improv is happening. And sometimes they will be aware that someone has been pimped is the word. Hey, tell me about your date. Hey, I got a, got a, we got that letter from college. Why don't you read it? You know, the audience is aware that that in a play you wouldn't laugh at that, but in an improv scene, there's something to that. There's there's something going on. So those are those fun moments where the improvisers themselves are characters in the show that the audience is watching as they struggle to come up with <laughs> a name or or whatever. That's, that's a fun story. Something I've also done is. I think along the lines of question, like asking questions in scenes is I will play into the strengths of my, whoever I'm playing with a lot of times. Like I was a part of a show called World News Tonight and there's a guy on the team, Shane Wilson, who's a really fantastic improviser and just a really smart dude. There was some scene where, I can't remember what it was, but I was maybe a teacher and he was a student. There's some sort of power dynamic or maybe I was his dad and he was my kid and he went to borrow the car for prom or something. But what I did is I said something where I'm like, along the lines of, you're not able to take the car to prom unless you can tell me the first the names of the first 20 presidents. And then I like looked real smug and poured myself a little brandy snifter and like sat down triumphant. But me, the improviser, I know Shane knows the name of every president and, uh, and vice can, president and vice president and can <laughs> tell you a million details about all of it. So he steadied himself, looked sad for a minute and then lifted up his chin and rattled off the first 20 presidents in 30 seconds. And the crowd went absolutely wild because I knew what my friend was capable of. I set him up for success with a question. I knew he'd be able to knock out of the park. There's that thing of like, I I almost asked the improviser the question versus the character, but it was just a matter of like, I want to set up my friend for success. And I can do like when I'm playing with Matt Young in a scene, instead of saying like, how was your day today? I might start the scene by saying, my liege, how doth it go? Right knowing that Matt is an absolutely incredible Shakespearean improviser, I would set him up to succeed with a question in a manner and a style in which he can absolutely thrive and the audience can feed off of that. Almost like you know the answer or haven't. So I think even though I wasn't really thinking about our philosophy lesson at all during the second scene because I was so busy trying to answer your questions, but uh, I think I can give an attempt at a solution, which is that you have a question that presupposes a certain context, a certain range of expected answers. But then hopefully, if it's an interesting kind of inquiry, the answers you get push in different directions, change those expectations. And that's, of course, how improvisation works. And so in this, there are certain parameters for what constitutes a date. And in the interest of humor, I was trying to violate those and eventually bringing a murder into it so that those would shift the, no, you didn't know that there was a dead body in my trunk when you started asking the questions, but one thing naturally leads to another. And that maybe that's a good model for inquiry of any sort. Sure. You're two for two with murder content today, Mark. <laughs> it's a real Poirot day. I, at some point, 
<laughs> there will be. Uh, I'm feeling like there are are certain subjects that maybe are cheap that are just wells that to go back to easily, and and anything to do with demonology or death or any of that kind of stuff, those are at least things that I have not gotten sick of yet or I'm not too ashamed of myself. Whereas I feel like, Bill, (laughs) you consistently work in the smaller moments that you don't feel like you need to reach to alien invasions or whatever for our, our random uh, scenes that you have. A, a, We're getting you there, Mark. We're getting you there. <laughs> don't worry. That I, I, have to reach, I have to reach up to the stars and pull down something that seems bizarre to me. Yeah, I got to say, I have to admit, Mark, it's kind of sad to see you lean on something like that. Like, it's as if like an improviser leaned on like wordplay constantly. It's, it's, it's just like <laughs> sad to see sometimes. <laughs> Well, yeah. I better get going. <laughs> well, well, I knew that in, uh, likewise, like you were talking with, with you asking Matt with Young questions, that if I gave you a super British name, that you would respond with your spot on British accent that would be just as good as mine. My- <laughs> What's funny is I was so prepared to do a French accent to mirror you, and then ah. you gave me a British name, and so I tried to sound British, but then I think line three or four, I slipped slightly into French because I was so mentally prepping myself for a French accent. So that was, uh, that was going on behind the scenes in my head. There was a possibility that you would have been unmasked as some other nationality. That came up I in there. I should have switched characters <laughs> mid-scene. Yo, well, there it is. I thought, if anything, that you would, as witness, be like, this is a bunch of bullshit, I'm getting out of here, and then here's a new <laughs> witness that you would get to be, that, that would be the character switch. But the character was uh, was accommodating enough. We did not have to do that. So oh, I bother it. me. I'm not guilty. I, I assume you're looking for the face in the back of my head, Robert. <laughs> uh, that's a good well. <laughs> Faces in the back of the heads. My absorbed twin who sticks out of my neck. <laughs> yeah. Kind of Voldemort. Morty. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Quirrell. So have we... Uh, exhausted bill did you have any more to say about your thing or it's already been out on the table and i think mine was smiling no table a smiling no adel you are our guest judge do you feel like that there is even enough to distinguish between the two lessons here that you can pick one of them as being the more profound the thing that will have improved the world most through the hour that we have spent together um one let me just say as judge everybody won today gold medal all around (laughs) Oh, no. Um, You know what? I can't really, I think I need time to process everything. But I think, I mean, just personally, and this is no slide against anyone in in terms of like their making their case or or the the information given. But I think just in terms of like what was most palatable to my brain was like what Bill was saying, just because it directly feeds into what I do on a day-to-day basis, which is improv. So I think immediate reaction, you know, crossbow to my head, I would go with that one. But I really enjoy, Mark, that you've given me something to chew on for the next week or so to really think about and really kind of try and digest and pinpoint in my day-to-day interactions. All right. So like when so many sports teams play, they reach the end and they're like, well, okay, so this team won, so improv won, Mm -hmm. but we might revisit this in a couple weeks and give you a different answer. That Most fans are totally cool with that. Yeah. It's a rematch, just like professional wrestling. (laughs) It's never over. Never over. Well, we very much appreciate your uh, sitting through this, Adel, and thanks for having me. We, and thanks for saying I sat through this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, unlike Bill, who is standing and pacing the whole time, I, you it's know, the sitting, fidgety. I think is more yeah. professional. I, but Bill likes to mm-hmm. use his the imaginary props when we yes. do these scenes. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was kind of doing the the pipe. There was some pole vaulting involved. Uh, you know, sometimes he's not right on mic all the time when he does that, but he has a headset, so it's okay. If I'm not seven eighths full of pee pee, then I just can't improvise. <laughs> I just need that pressure and that urgency. Here's how good Bill's object work is he has Alfredo sauce all over his beard <laughs> from this Olive Garden we went to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It, it's not marinara, <clears throat> it's Alfredo. It's not that garlic butter either. Yeah, it is Alfredo. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you, listeners. Thank you, Adel. Thank you, listeners. I really thank you, thank you for having me. Enjoyed learning from you today, Bill and Adel. And I enjoyed learning from both of you. And see. Nah. Thanks for listening to the show. Please make sure you're subscribed directly to Philosophy vs. Improv. You can look to show up on the podcasting service of your choice or go to philosophyimprov.com. And at philosophyimprov.com slash support, you'll find a couple options for getting an ad-free version of the show feed in return for a ridiculously small episode donation. And the supportive versions of those episodes, in addition to having no ads, also have 
our special post-game section, which I'm going to demonstrate by playing for you right here. You get to have the supporter experience right now because Adel is great, and I want you to hear a little more of us chatting with him. Here we go. Hey. Hey, we're, thank you guys so much for having me on. Yeah, we're now we're now in the supporter portion. We don't actually have to do this if you want to run, but tell us have more some, about your current projects. Is it still the two podcasts, but siblings specular, you know, fell off the radar, or is that back, or is there a, a third, a different third one now? Yeah, so you can check out my podcast, Hello from the Magic Tavern, which is an improvised fantasy podcast where I play Chunt the Shapeshifter. And then I also do a podcast, I think you mentioned it earlier, Mark, called Hey Riddle Riddle, which is uh, me and two friends trying to solve puzzles, lateral thinking problems, riddles, and along the way we improvise scenes. And yes, I, I do. Uh, I had a podcast called Sibling Specular, but we haven't done a new episode in four years or so. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. I thought there was some. Somebody we were talking. Oh, it was Tim we were talking to. Was like, oh yeah, we're doing a we're doing a break on Magic Tavern until until Adel figures out his schedule. I thought maybe you had you had been promote you had gotten involved in something else that was taking up your time. Taking a break until I figure out my schedule. This was I don't know what that would have been. Yeah, (laughs) maybe he was talking out of his ass, or maybe I'm talking out of my ass now. I don't know. Considering grad school, you know, thinking about grad school, always, (laughs) always, yes, always on that back burner. (laughs) <laughs> is there a PhD in improvisation? Are there doctors, Dr. Improv? Um, there's Dr. know it alls mm-hmm. which is an improv game from comedy sports. I don't know if you can get a doctor. I don't think any university would, would offer that. Would honor that. <laughs> <laughs> there, must, there are theater professors that have yeah. doctors in front of their names. Yeah. There must be some theater professors who are fond of improv. I'm sure there are. And those you know, are the I, only ones that I want to have on the show. <laughs> they have to be credentialed. <laughs> Improv's not happening in the universities. It's happening on the streets. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's happening in the clubs and the smoky pool halls uh, across this country. All right. And anyone who tells you that they can, you know, learn this by some out of a book, no. They the, is improv- the answer. The improvisation will not be televised. Thank you. Thank I mean, you it, it is good that I have this podcast because otherwise I do try to do improv on the streets and it is not appreciated. If you just try to get something going, just like do a scene with a with a well, unless you're, when you're checking out at a, a grocery store and you're like ho ho ho, I see you have uh, uh, we're here on, in the Antarctic together. What do you think of that? They, Welcome to my life, Mark. Welcome to my life. <laughs> I so unappreciated with all the improv I try to do out in the wild. Yeah, truly, it's like I go to the bank and I'm like, can I withdraw some money? And then they hand me bills and I'm like, what is this currency? These aren't my McDougals I'm used to. And they get so annoyed and I don't understand it. I'm just trying to have some fun and the line behind me is growing. Yeah, yeah. I think they like it better if you set up if you set up your phone on a stand to film to film the interaction, then they, then they know what's up. They know that you're uh, doing Jackass 5 or whatever. If you're Billy Eichner, you can get away with murder on the street. Everyone loves it. Everyone's laughing. Thank God this man came up to me. But if you're anyone else, you will be arrested and detained. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you're wearing Converse high tops. Yeah. And even more so if you are offering cash prizes. Yeah. Do you, do you think that it is more or less polite to have a, a, a puppet handy when you, when you go up to someone on the street? Because at least then they know what to expect. That if you start talking to them through the puppet, then they're like, oh, okay, I, this is a certain kind of joker. I was like the Mr. Rogers mentality of like, kids will talk to this puppet because it's not me. I'm not, they're not talking to an adult. They're talking to a little frog or something. Yeah. Yeah. That if I just, if I'm at the Stuckies and I say to the, the waitress, just fuck you, then like, what's that? I'm going to get thrown out. But if I have a puppet and like, fuck you, then <laughs> it is generally, they're like, that's a piece of entertainment. I really appreciate that. I say go try that at five or ten Stuckies and report back. <laughs> I'm curious to know. We can speculate all we want, but that's just speculation. I think you would be ignored. I think you'd be ignored, and then you would be a story for the rest of someone's life. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? You're welcome. They're welcome. They're welcome. <laughs> that's what making a difference in the world, one one memory at a time, providing strangers with uh, Crazy stories to tell their, their grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, I, I think there's something to be said about like if you go to a Stuckies and pull out a puppet to the waiter and say "fuck you," you are an absolute monster. You're you're the worst in society. But if because 
waiters and specifically at waiters at a, I, I'm sorry to say, probably a lower end chain restaurant like Stucky's, they probably have a pretty harsh schedule. They're probably not getting a ton of pay and everything. So, you know, it is what it is. But I feel like if you went to some like ah. hip bar, if you went to Logan Square in Chicago and went to some really cool hip bar during a, a down like 4 p.m. or something before the rush, and you sat down and had a puppet and said, like, fuck you. I bet the bartender legit would probably chuckle or humor you. Yeah. So I think it's probably something to do with, like, the person you're interacting with in their sort of current situation with their their job, the situation, whatever that might be, their their typical clientele. So I think uh, I think there is a window of opportunity or hope that that might be fun or funny, but it's pretty slim and it's very dependent on uh, on where you're pushing your wares. Yeah. Man, that is such a thoughtful answer to such a stupid <laughs> suggestion. Because I, I think I, I've worked jobs where I'm like, I wish somebody would come in with a puppet and say, fuck you. Because then I would just be like, this is interesting. What? Let, let's see where this goes. Let me pull on this thread. But I feel like I've also worked jobs where I'm like, if somebody did that to me, I would end their life. <laughs> well, I, I think yeah. maybe improvisation, like the point in getting a training improvisation, it's it's like getting physical training that then if you're out and you slip on the ice and you can catch yourself without ripping your arm out of its socket because you've been training like this, that if you're in a situation where somebody else engages you in a bizarre way, then as improviser, you could be like, I know how to respond to this. I can play. I can play the frustration game. I could do, (laughs) you have options, not just be dumbfounded. A lot of improv, at least for me, is like Karate Kid, where it's like, I'm painting the fence and I don't know why, or I'm sanding the floor and I'm like, this hurts my elbow. Why are we doing this? But you're right in terms of, at some point, all those hours, all that repetition just becomes instinctual. And that's the, like you said, with like falling on the ice. And if you have, you know, any sort of training, you can, you can put an arm down, um, quick reflexes. So I do think that there's something to that where improv becomes improv is, is tedious at first. And there are those things of like, no questions, no questions, no questions. But then when it becomes instinctual, you can hit the stage and, and feel confident in your abilities and respond to any, hopefully anything in real time. Exactly like Karate Kid. <laughs> and by sit the stage, yeah. you just mean sitting behind a microphone and not having to actually physically put yourself out there in any way. That, that's what you mean, right? A hundred percent. I'm a physical coward. <laughs> yes, and is your crane kick. Yeah. <laughs> you know, don't ask questions is your mm-hmm. half Nelson. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is I, that our karate move? <laughs> <laughs> Sketch is my uh, Johnny. Mm-hmm, now mm-hmm. I'm wondering about a painting the, the the fence scene. If we just had a whole, this is I, I was at least playing with the idea. We we've never gotten to the point where a whole episode is one scene, and this uh, detective thing seemed a, a promising enough. You know that could have been an hour long if we really <laughs> <laughs> maybe mixed it up. Maybe had multiple interviews or something. I mean, any uh, of these scenes could have been an hour long. Mark that the the. the <laughs> So, but just but, but painting the fence, like you know, next three people, it's three Stooges style paint. I don't know if you, usually you'd get on yeah. different parts of the fences, but presumably you're all standing next to each other, so you can move over one rung at a time. Uh, and doing that for a half hour, forty five minutes straight. I don't know. Is that the worst improv you've ever seen? <laughs> well, I think, I think as long as you allow for distractions, mm. I, like I think you know, like the the interrogation scene. I think that that personally can only go so long in terms of holding an audience uh, an audience's interest. But if you mix it up in terms of allowing yourself to get distracted, like I, I've done scenes where it's like, you know, not to get dark again, but it, you know, if it's somebody in the electric chair, it's that idea of like, we can watch this scene forever. If every time I go to pull the switch, the person in the chair is like, oh, did you ever watch MASH? And I'm like, what's up? And they're like, do you ever watch MASH? You know, Hawkeye, MASH? And I'm like, Oh, I think I caught some episodes as a kid, or at least I saw the finale, right? So if they're, if we can get distracted and talk about other subjects, and that can, that can, that's a country road that can lead back to the highway of <laughs> facing imminent death. But I think those distractions breathe some new air into it and allow, uh, allow like a, a watchability for the audience. But if it's just an interrogation for an hour, I think the audience's eyes are going to glaze over like a great white shark and they're going <laughs> to they're going <laughs> to keep moving to stay alive out of the theater. I guess the 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 premise for the scene why I thought it could go is because that I could as somebody who doesn't really know what questions to ask that which is the initial conception of the scene that I could just be like What's next for Reginald Pickford? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's huh? as a murder suspect? What's a question you wish someone would ask you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> are you innocent? Uh, are could, you innocent? Yes. 
you know, if, if Magic Tavern can be the premise for an entire podcast, then detective and sidekick interviewing potential murder suspects, one could... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> There's absolutely. meat on that bone. I don't think I'm going to chew it, but it's all well, yours. You know, Mark... <laughs> This is the thing we've talked about, this whole notion of, of kind of divorcing the, the obvious what from the what's going on between the people and that the what's going on between the people is, is where your jam is, that's where your sauce is. And the journalists, who, what, where is pretty surfacey and may not, may not buy a lot. And, uh, this notion of what, what's really going on is here's this kooky French detective, clearly in the United States. D- dressed like he's in the 19th century <laughs> and everyone is like, uh, you know, a- a- and that's that kind of thing where it's, it's how everyone reacts and feels and is around all that. That's going to be where you're, where, 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 that's where, that's where you get your paycheck right there. The interaction between all those people is going to be fascinating and fun, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Any, uh, reactions <laughs> on the, uh, other thoughts about the format having sat through this now did does this seem a, a viable <laughs> way to run a show you're Adult? asking me yes <laughs> <laughs> i'm pulling the plug um i th- i think it's a i think it's a fascinating show and a fascinating concept and i find the i, th- I think most importantly i find the two of you fascinating therefore it's all gravy so yeah i th- i think it's really cool if I absolutely had to make a change or else I'd lose a loved one, it might have been more fun for me as a guest to be in on what the goal is because mm. then I can help kind of push it in a certain direction. So sure. I think, yeah. I think I was, I was a little worried about like, as there's maybe some sort of example being demonstrated or a lesson to be learned, I was a little worried about sometimes I play a little fast and loose where I'm like, hopefully I'm not negating the experience that's meant to be had or anything. So <laughs> yes, that's reasonable. Yeah, yeah I, I've sense. left. I've, I'm going to take that as a note for Bill because I, I, with my philosophy guests, some of them I have specifically like. Okay, you give me some possible topics. You actually be the person who's bringing it in. But Bill is such a wealth of. Uh, he's he's not seen fit so far to uh, do any planning in advance with his improv guests. Yeah, I, I, how, yeah. How, what a coincidence that the improviser doesn't want to pre-plan. <laughs> I'll, I'll take the note and the victory, Mark. How about that? <laughs> Damn. Sounds good. All right. I will say also, I, I, pardon me because I forget the name because it's been a few years since I read it, but Bill has one of the best books on improv out there as well. If any improvisers are looking for material, which I feel like most improvisers are because there's not a lot of books on improv, but it, I remember reading it a few years ago when I first picked it up and it being brilliant. So Bill, oh, uh, thanks, Bill would you remind me of the name of that, please? The Complete Improviser. Thank you. But I would highly recommend picking up a copy of that. Yeah, I bought a Thank copy you, of that so. right yes. bef- before, as Bill and I were in the planning stages for this podcast. But then I felt like I want to be like the audience and I want to be have my virgin ears not already knowing his lessons. So I think I'm going to, this is going to be a, a pre-season two experience. <laughs> I'm, adoles- I'm, I'm pretty much adolescent. Mark. You're, it's safe now. We've <laughs> covered that <laughs> material. <laughs> All right. That I will. Uh, we, we, oh, we, there could be a segment on your show called, uh, one other thing. There should be a segment on your show called Adolescents <laughs> and it's where you teach me lessons. Mm-hmm. I play a petulant child and you teach me lessons. <laughs> I love it. I did like, Pair of paralegals. That was yeah. <laughs> as that a pair of paralegals. A, see, that's a good. <laughs> yeah. That's a whole podcast in itself. Yeah, yeah. These two guys are just like they work at a law firm, but it's like they have the crappiest cars in the law firm parking lot. Yeah, <laughs> these, it's all BMWs and Mercedes. With these two guys with the with the Hondas. Oh, they're, they're the paralegals. The pair of par- oh my gosh, you guys, you're just always everywhere. Well, so inseparable. I, I feel like the the <laughs> podcast landscape is changing for information podcasts. That the expectation is more that there's going to be expertise. And so the whole premise of my philosophy podcast was, yeah, okay, we did some schooling, but we're not professors on this stuff. We haven't been teaching this stuff. We're just going to read it and sort of be like you and make you part of our reading group. So I think there is something in the in the legal area. Of course, there are people like in sports, you know, we're just going to do sports talk. We're just fans of sports. Mm-hmm. So I think that is a, a great idea for a legal podcast of like, yeah, you know, we've worked around the law some. We've, uh, let's just... What do you think about this thing? I don't really know anything about it. I feel like audiences might not appreciate getting legal advice that way, but could you have a legal advice show where it's like, we are not lawyers, but we would be giving legal advice? <laughs> just like, I don't know. Course, it's just like, they give it their best, and it's, of course it's horrible. They're waving, it's just asking for a lawsuit, I guess. But 
<laughs> I think it'd be funny if it was that, and then every episode contains like a bonus episode where it's all the retractions and like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> forty five minutes done, of retractions. Yeah, yes, yeah. After having done a modicum of research, here's the apologies need to be made. Well, it turns out if that tree falls in your yard, it is the neighbor's responsibility, <laughs> and you don't get the firewood. I thought I thought you could. So you're I making really did. You're, you're making me addle think of the disclaimer at the beginning of the McElroy podcast, which it was you who, on your first appearance with me, made some comparison or mentioned mentioned them, and I didn't know who they were, and mm. I have since spent so much goddamn time on their products. Uh, sure, uh, podcast royalty. Quite quite a bit more than uh, now. <laughs> That I'm not caught up with Magic Tavern anymore because I'm listening to 2014, my brother, my brother, and me. Uh, sure. But I will get, I will get caught back up. Oh, I, but I, I, I blame, don't care either way. I will blame you. <laughs> it's not something you need to tell me. I don't care. <laughs> There's some people do that to me all the time, where they're like, they'll see me in public and they're like, "Oh my gosh, are you Chunt?" I'm like, "Yeah," and they're like, "It's so nice to meet you." Um, and they'll ask me a few questions, and then they're like. I'm not caught up. And I'm like, <laughs> I didn't ask. And they're like, are you mad? And I'm like, what? I don't care. Like, what are you doing? But it's such a funny thing where it's like, I have to immediately disclose. It's just, it's just weird. It's like going up to David Schwimmer and be like, David Schwimmer, you're Ross and friends. I liked Chandler better. <laughs> and he's like, I'm trying to shop for steaks, my dude. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. Hey, that was 30 years ago. Let's just, yeah. let's just start right there. Have you done any work since Ross? <laughs> that would be the more insulting question. Yeah. <laughs> are you still doing your little looking glass project? Oh, <laughs> Hey, you keep it. You have a dream. You keep at it. <laughs> Maybe someday. Awesome. You'll be on another. <laughs> all right. I'm swooning. Sitcom. I, uh, yeah, once in right. hundred years. All this, yeah. all this uh, celebrity contact is making me weak. So I need to I need to jump off. Thank you so much again. Bye, supporters. supporters. And yeah. uh, you know Thanks to, everybody. And great seeing you again, Adol. I hope you're doing well. Great to see you. I am and, and I hope you're doing well as well. As well. That's a weird phrase. Yeah. <laughs> and Mark, thank you so much for having me on. Mm-hmm. And Bill as well. Thank you guys. Indeed, indeed. Have a great rest of your day. Bye forever. I should sell my soul. Bankrupt. Bankrupt. Bankrupt.